So as Dave mentioned, there is a series of things we can talk about. Um, but I guess the first one is the Bosch CPI. And I think what we can do is we can go fast on it, and then depending on the questions, uh, go deeper. I'll set a timer for 30 minutes to try to get it done in 30 minutes, and then that way we can switch over to the next topic. But if you are interested and you have questions, then ask me, and then we can, we can go a little bit deeper. Um, so uh, first thing is to mention that um, this is actually work that is uh, going in production right now. What I mean by this is we've been working on this for about a year, where we uh, rewrote uh, the uh, layer that talks to uh, the software cloud uh, for Bluemix. And anybody that doesn't know Bluemix, Bluemix is uh, easily the largest uh, Cloud Foundry installation right now. And pretty much everything is moving to this code. The best part is I was able to convince enough people at IBM that this code should be public. So you're seeing everything, OK? You can just go and play with it. Uh, the only thing you're not seeing is a private repo for credentials that we keep. Otherwise, everything is there. Okay? There is some sort of IBM proprietary releases, but nothing is in the code. It's like if you were to install it on your own uh, account on software, you could use the same code. You'd probably have additional releases just like we do. But otherwise, it's the same code. All right. So what is, why, you know, sort of like, what's the motivation behind this and sort of getting you to what a CPI is uh, so that um, you can actually uh, start using this? So let me start. Um, so uh, the agenda is sort of going over uh, some of the problems that existed before and what Bosch init does to solve it. So uh, this is the new micro Bosch in some ways. And then uh, external CPIs. Okay, for people that don't know, I'll kind of motivate a little bit of it, uh, but not in too much detail. Uh, but think of it as sort of a shim between um, the deployer of Cloud Foundry and the actual cloud that you talk to, because Cloud Foundry can work on multiple clouds, so that shim can change, right? And then we'll deep dive a little bit. You know, we'll go into some deep dive of the soft layer CPI. But what's important here is for me to kind of give you an idea of how the code is organized and point you to different pieces. And then I'll do a little demo of a real deployment of Bluemix itself. Uh, so you'll be one of the few people to see this. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of like what's next. Uh, of course, the demo is very long because it takes, you know, a fair amount of time to deploy uh, an entire Bluemix installation. So what I'll do is I have a recorded demo and I'll just fast forward to it. Okay, but you'll see it in action. Um, so what is Bosch? Bosch is essentially uh, the shell for uh, uh, cloud, right? The, the cloud shell for Cloud Foundry. So think of it as, you know, when you're using your uh, Unix system or your Mac system, you bring up a shell like, say, iTerm, and you can issue command and you can do things. Uh, think of Bosch as exactly the same thing, except that what it's operating in on, on, on is the cloud that you're targeting. So if you're targeting AWS, then Bosch allows you to issue commands on AWS. If you're targeting Cloud Foundry, then you can do that. But how does it know about AWS? How does it know about um, SoftLayer? How does it know about OpenStack? How does it know about your, like Renat has his own cloud? He doesn't, but let's say he did. Uh, how would it know about it? Well, it would know about it because you would build this CPI, OK? Uh, and why is Bosch interesting? Is because it allows you to do things from one file. So you have one file that describes all of your system, how they connect to each other. Uh, something like Bluemix is hundreds of VMs with different you know, processes running on each VM. For any simple installation of Cloud Foundry, it's, a, it, it's at least 20 VMs, right? Because you need a cloud controller, you need UAA for login authentication, you need a series of DEA so that you can run the workloads. Uh, you need your HM9000 and the old cases. In the case of Diego, you're going to have various different VMs. And all of these things need to start. And they all need to kind of know about each other. And they all need to start connecting to each other. So how do you make that happen? That is what Bosch does. With Bosch, you describe this deployment. And then you 
essentially connect with the cloud piece. You know, so you tell it, I want to do this very complex deployment, and I want to do it on soft layer. And therefore, I need a virtual LAN, and I need these IPs, and I need this and that. And I need these storage components to also be connected. That becomes your manifest. And out of that, you say, deploy. And the beauty of Bosch is that if you wanted to go from, say, 20 VM to 30 VM, because your capacity is, is increasing, you can just tweak some value in your manifest, and you deploy again. And you can keep doing that. In addition to this, it also gives you ability for you to debug. So when something goes wrong, you can look at the logs for a particular VM. You can see the state of the world in some ways. right? So that's why it gives you a shell. Okay? The problem was that it's not perfect. Um, it's, it's, it's a unique tool. Um, if you've never played with it, when you play with it, you might have two reactions. One is that it's hard and it's difficult. And then eventually, you'll get the reaction that it's actually pretty cool. Uh, I know Dr. Nick, for instance, uh, has a lot, given a lot of talks about Bosch and you know, praise uh, the value of it. Uh, you don't see that value until you start using it. Okay? Uh, so you, you do have to trust people at first um, to, to realize. Sure. Today, uh, Walmart just open source one just open source the one ops. What's your take on that? One ops, I, I don't know what it is. Let's uh, come back. To okay. That. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, so the thing, there are alternative to Bosch, but you know, I won't spend the time talking about those. But instead, I would say that it. It's not perfect. Uh, like every tool, it's a tool, so it's getting better. Um, and specifically, what I'll talk about today is how it got better uh, uh, around, for instance, making the CPI be reusable and component, uh, a component that you can just add. Um, and it used to be mostly written in Ruby. It still is, but there are parts of it that are rewritten in Go. And certainly, your CPI can be written in any language you want. So in the case of the software CPI, we wrote it in Go as well. Um, so what's the first change? The first change is Bosch in it. Um, so in order to start Bosch, think of it as you know, if you're running something like, like uh, Bluemix, where we announced already having a million users, um, you can imagine that um, there's multiple installation of this thing so that you can test stuff before you actually put it in front of the customers. Um, and how do you actually manage those different deployments? And you could imagine also with an IBM being a large company, there's probably also various installation of this platform for internal use. So all of these different deployments, you can actually manage with one Bosch installation. right? You, so you deploy this thing called a micro Bosch. So essentially, you think of it as the bootstrap. And then from there, you can deploy more things. So this initial Bosch uh, needs to be, in some ways, deployed. Right? You could deploy it, like say, for instance, in one VM. But you could deploy it in more than one VM. So Bosch init is a rewritten version of this micro Bosch um, in Go. So you can use it to start your initial Bosch. Okay? Uh, I have a different sort of talk on, you know, that I gave about Go. Um, first, I guess the question, I'm not, I don't work for Google, so I'm not trying to promote uh, you know, Go because of any particular company. It just is a kick-ass programming language. It does the job when it comes to system programming. So first thing I'll ask is, how many people have looked at Go? A program, then Go. A little bit, OK. So, if you take one thing out of this talk, besides trying Bosch and Cloud Foundry, would be to go and try Go. Uh, and the reason for this is it's, very, it's different uh, as a programming language. But when it comes to cloud stuff, I am convinced that at this point in time, there's nothing better than Go for doing cloud stuff. Um, I really don't care, you know, at least in my experience, um, whatever the problem is, if it's cloud related, Go is a better approach. And the reason for this, uh, I try to motivate in a, a different talk. But it's mainly because of, uh, I think, this notion of dependency. So if you think of cloud, things fail, and you have to deploy all the time, and you can have to like, move things around. 
And um, in most other languages, say Ruby, Java, Python, um, the program is written and the dependency is part of the runtime. And of course, everything has dependencies, meaning like libraries, right? Uh, and the problem with that is as soon as you do it in your computer as a developer, everything works. But if I give it to Dave, who's my DevOps guy, uh, Dave has to either have a complete replication of my environment, which is impossible because you know, it's never going to be exactly like my environment. I mean, you could use Docker and Docker images for that, but still have issues to replicate. And all the dependencies also have to come with it in order for a perfect deployment to happen. So Go solves this problem because instead of pushing the dependency management, which still exists, okay? So Go still has dependency management. But instead of Dave having to worry about it when he puts it on the cloud, the developer has to worry about it. So when you build Go code and you, and you give a binary to somebody that's going to go deploy it, that binary includes everything. That's the key message. Now, there's all kinds of other reasons to use Go, but this particular one is key because then there is no dependency management anymore uh, for the DevOps guy. It's the developer. And who's the best person to solve those things? The developer, right? You'd hope so. So that's one of the good, good things. So we rewrote uh, the uh, Michael Bosch in, uh, in Go. And we kind of have one binary. So when you go, and, and like uh, David Lee on the back used to work at Pivotal, and he worked on the CLI. And that was a huge success too, because we rewrote the CLI of Cloud Foundry from Ruby to Go. And all, you know, every time we release to Dave, I work uh, for Dave and his team, uh, basically he would send an email saying, hey, everybody go and, and download this one binary. And of course we had to create a binary for you know, Apple, one for Linux, and so on. But you know, invariably you just download that one binary and it worked. So that's the beauty, okay? So with, with uh, the Bosch init, we did exactly the same thing but for this small portion of Bosch. And then the other thing we did also is to see a way to decouple the CPI code with Bosch itself. So that's what those external CPIs are about, right? So here's an example of a Michael Bosch uh, deployment manifest. Uh, I realize it's, it's kind of um, small here, but the important thing to mention is that you, are min you, you, you list your provider, the cloud that you're going to talk to, right? And then you specify your instance pools and your network and so on. But once you have that, then you can deploy. And what ends up happening in the deployment, you can see here. Um, so this whole thing is sort of what's going on inside the Bosch init. Uh, you take this manifest, which has two parts to it. The deployment, meaning I want one VM, I want this network, I want this storage, I want all this stuff. And then another piece of it which says, I'm talking to AWS, so I need, those are my credentials, those are the information for AWS, so I'm talking to SoftLayer. And then you provide uh, three releases. Uh, one is the CPI, one is Bosch, and one is the stem cell. The stem cell is essentially the image so that when you start the VM, the VM starts with some kind of an operating system. Think of the stem cell as a very bare bone Linux machine, right? It has very minimal thing. It has really one additional thing besides the basic Linux and libraries. It has a, the Bosch agent. So that when you deploy the VM, the VM can talk back to the Michael Bosch. Okay? So what ends up happening is you get an installation. And at some point, it talks to your CPI. And I'll talk about this. And it talks to your agent, too. Okay? Um, of course, you can do other things uh, with the Bosch init. Like, for instance, you can delete um, you know, the VM. So you can start it, and you can delete it. And then from that Bosch, um, Michael Bosch, you can go and deploy something like Bluemix, which is going to be you know, tens of VMs for, as a minimal uh, installation. Right? So let me show you guys uh, the demo quickly. I'm skipping ahead because I want to show you something that is more interesting. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the first one, which is to sort of like start Bosch init. So you can see 
we are at a um, machine here, and you can see that we have a CPI release. So it's like a tall ball, right? Um, we have the stem cell, OK? And then we have the manifest. So we'll show you the manifest. So you can see it points to the releases. It points to um, uh, the, you specify a resource pool. In the case of software, you have to tell it, you know, how many CPUs the VM has to be, um, you know, what's the domain of it, and things like that. Uh, and then you point to the stem cell. In this case, everything is in a local file system, so that's why we're using file. And then you specify some properties for the CPI. So the CPI can have properties that you specify. So those properties, the Bosch init will just take those and pass it to the CPI. So it, you define them when you build your own CPI. And then, um, you know, you see those releases, and then you issue the command, which is um, a very simple command, right? Um, you'll see it here. Bosch init, deploy, and then you point to that, um, that YAML file, which is your manifest, okay? Everything else is like debugging, right? Where do you put the debug information? Do you want to turn debug on? So when something goes wrong, you can actually go see it. So I'm going to uh, step through this faster so that we can um, see the result. So there you go. So we say run it. You can see it's starting the compilation of the release. It's starting the instance. Um, now, software is great. I work for IBM, so I'm, a, I'm obliged to tell you this. <laughs> the v, actually, it's pretty stable, I would tell you this. But it's kind of slow when you start VM sometimes. So that's what's happening here. So we'll just uh, go faster here. Um, so the VM is starting and then, you know, and all this good stuff. Okay, so now it creates a disk. You can see it attaches the disk. And then it compiles some more jobs, like Nginx. Uh, this uh, ISO image, Ruby. You still need Ruby because the Bosch release itself has Ruby in it. So you need Ruby for that. And then uh, Redis. Uh, it's part of Cloud Foundry pretty much and everything we do. Uh, Postgres is also, you need a database for the director. The Bosch director needs a database, and that's what that is. And then uh, NATS, which is the communication, the director job itself, health monitoring. And then you can see it's done now. So you can, from there, you can log in, and then you can see Bosch is up and running, right? And you can see all those processes. So in some ways, what, what, what happened here is that you get, um, you get you know, not only um, the VM up and running, but each one of those are jobs within that one VM. So Bosch does that for you, right? It, will, it knows that your release included all those jobs, and it keeps them running. And it will monitor them. So if something goes down, uh, it can, you can restart those things. OK, so that's getting the, the first Bosch version running, right? So let's go back and then, uh, and then sort of like go to the next step. So um, what is the CPI? So now that you've seen it in action, how did that happen? You know, how do you, now how do you build it too? Uh, and I'll point you to the source code so you could actually go in and, I mean, I wouldn't say reuse it, but you can use it as a pattern, for instance, right? Um, so it's the interface between Bosch, like you saw us doing Bosch in it, and you know, eventually we'll do Bosch deployment as well, with the actual cloud. And what's cool is, all you need to do is to implement like 13 methods. So at a, at a bare minimum, you could have a, a, a CPI that's just one file that implements those 13 methods, and then you're done. But of course, you know, the Bosch init needs to talk to those, and it talks to it to a shell. So you'd have, to under, you'd have to implement some kind of a parsing of JSON, and then you'd have to implement return of those things. So it's a little bit more complicated than just 13 methods. But conceptually, that's what you're doing. So what are those methods? Uh, it's like create VM, delete VM create this, attach this, detach disk, right? uh, configure networks, and so on and so forth. So you have to implement those. And then once you implement that, you wrap it around the protocol that Bosch understands. And then that's pretty much it. Now, it gets more complicated because when you try to deploy a very large system like Bluemix, you start getting into all kinds of little detail. And the cloud itself has various intricacies. So we'll look at the code. Of, for instance, create VM, and then you'll see that we had to 
kind of work on voice kind of uh, detail and uh, to make it happen, All right? So this is uh, the code. So instead of looking at it that way, let's look at it from uh, the code itself. So this is the open source uh, project. Um, and you can see I have a team from Beijing working on it. So you'll see me like merging code from various different people. Um, and the best way to, to look at this code is there is an API section that sort of deals with you know, exposing like the communication layer, right? Because uh, it's not REST. It's sort, of, it's sort of like REST, but it's not quite REST. Um, because it's, it's process to process, right? The director is talking to this CPI process, and it's sending JSON. So that's the way to think of it. Uh, we have uh, an action. Uh, and that's probably where most of the important stuff are, right? And there's like a factory that allows you to create the actions. And you can see here, we put the available actions. So when you see a create VM, then you create this instance, right? So what's happening here in Go is you're setting up a uh, map of string and the, the type action and the name of the, the, so the key to the map is the name of the, of the action, right? Which corresponds to the name of the VM, uh, of the um, method, right, in the CPI. So let's just look at one, right? Let's look at, obviously, create VM, just because that's sort of the, the most uh, used one, right? So it's doing a deployment. Obviously, the first thing you need to do is to create a VM, right? So if we, think, if we look at that, what's going to happen is somewhere in there, there's going to be a VM creator right? that gets created that passes some information. Don't worry about those details for now. But let's go look at the code for create VM. So create VM uh, action, um, you can see it here. Uh, it takes things like, for instance, a stem cell finder, VM creator, cloud properties. But at the end of the day, you can see it does things like, OK, let me see if the stem cell you told me about to create the VM with exist. And this is a pattern you're going to see in Go a lot, which is that every method, uh, so there's no exception in Go, so I should mention that. And what that means is everything has to be checked yourself. Uh, it's a good thing, because typically people would write Java, and then they would just populate exception in their method definitions, and then you know, somebody upstairs worries about it. Well, that's usually when, when you crash. So instead, in Go, you have to deal with the error right there. Okay? Um, and you can see here, this stem cell finder, uh, if there is no stem cell, then you need to somehow deal with it. In this case, we just return the error. Right? Um, if, it, if we couldn't find it, right? if there was an error finding it, then we pass the error. If we couldn't find it, then same thing as well. And then you can see here, um, you know, we set up some network, so we get some network information and then an environment for the VM. And then we go to the creator object and say create. And that's when the VM gets created. And you can see what gets returned is this VM object where we can use its ID and return that. So that's pretty much the implementation of create VM. But the piece that's interesting is the piece that's going to talk to software, and that happens in this create, right? So let's go look at that. So if we go to um, the soft layer piece of that, right, and we go to the VM piece, then you can see there is a soft layer um, you know, VM. And that's when the VM gets created. And you can see it returns the ID and so on. And you want to delete it, you delete it that way. But the creator, the soft layer creator, is where we create the VM. Right? So you create a new one, you pass some information. And you create it. So, right. So create new VM is pretty much gets called, right? And you can see what's happening here, right? Um, the first step is we set up some kind of a template, right? Obviously, if there's an error, you return the error. Next thing is you can see we have this thing called software client. So. Upstairs, there's going to be a client that gets created for you. And then you get the service uh, in software to, to be able to deal with virtual guests. And then from there, you say create object, and you pass the template. 
And of course, if there was an error, then you can deal with the error as well. Oops. And then after that, you can see if there is a um, you know uh, ephemeral disk that wasn't you know uh, specified. Um, a lot of what you end up doing uh, in software and probably in other environment as well is to wait for things to be done. So understanding when you issue command to the cloud um, that before you return, the state of the object that you're asking to create is, is there. And in this case, in software, you can see we're waiting for transactions to be done because software has this notion of transaction. And of course, if you specified a uh, disk, then you're also waiting for the disk to be attached, right? And then when all of this is done, then the next step is to get the details on that virtual guess so that you can actually, um, you, know, uh, you know, I guess, use it, right? And the next step are things, for instance, to set up um, configuration. So in some ways, you got to be able to talk to from different VMs, the, the agent, yes? So how long will it take if uh, I launch UDR2 to launch a 2000 VM cluster? A cluster will allow 2000 VMs. 2000? Yeah, 2000. Or 1000. Uh, in, in, in the number of, in terms of 1000. And the, the single question is, uh, suppose software does not respond. What are you going to do? No, you keep retrying. You, there are retries, yes. So, so it's... Well, so it, it, I mean, it depends, right? If you, if you issue a thousand command at the same time, then you can spin up a thousand VM within that same period of time. Um, typically, Bosch manages those things for you. So Bosch tries to be, um, I guess, as efficient as it can. And typically, things are not, they don't have dependency. So it will spin up as much as it can, as fast as it can, right? So these create VM calls are not synchronous at all. So Bosch will call as many of those as it needs. So you could have like five VMs being created at the same time. OK. I, I don't think we've ever tried 1,000 VM like to try issue, because we don't have deployment that big. Uh, but certainly, we've issued you know, Bosch deploys with you know, close to 100 VMs, yes. So the rest of this is sort of to set up things. And what the reason I, want, I wanted to get into those details is to show you kind of, in many ways, the CPI is pretty straightforward in terms of you create a VM, you delete a VM, you create a disk, you delete this, you attach this, you detach this. The devil, of course, is in the details. So yes, you could create VMs easily, you could delete them easily. Getting it to work fully to have all the configurations and to have all the details of you created a VM, something happened, you wait for the transaction, you want it to be in a certain state <clears throat> before you attach a disk, before you do the next step, that's where it becomes complicated. And that's where it takes a little bit of time. So if you look at all CPIs, that ends up becoming the detail. So the first step is to get something where you have VMs being created. The next step is to go into the details. And certainly looking at code like this and other examples will, will help you. So let's move to, um, to the slides again, because I want to make sure we, we go through the rest. Um, so these are the methods, as I mentioned. Um, this particular version is completely written in Go, as I, as I mentioned before. It's about 16,000 lines of code uh, in uh, C log. And that doesn't include dependencies, right? So this is the code we wrote. Um, and part of it is a Go client for software that we wrote as well, called Software Go. So if you are, like for instance, we, we bought the Weather Channel, and they're using this. And uh, they, because they have their own installation on, on software, so they can use this to deploy. So if you're a customer of software, and you want to write your code that talks to software in Go, you can use this thing. It's about 6,000 lines, and then the rest is the CPI. Um, so one of the things we try to do, uh, just so you can get an idea of you know, our mindset, is that unlike Amazon, the software API is, is pretty massive. And I guess Amazon is getting also pretty complicated. 
And the reason for this is because it, it includes a lot of enterprise, sort of enterprise-y stuff. And I guess if you put all the Amazon APIs together, it might be as equivalent as this. But the API for software is very big. Um, and there was no Golang client for it. So what we did is to build up a Golang client. So we didn't try to do the entire API, but instead we did exactly what we needed for the CPI, and we kept adding things as we needed them, and then as people started using it. So like the people from Weather Channel, uh, you can see they have a pending PR right now that I've been working with them on, because they wanted to add a feature that we never cared about, but they wanted, so we added that. So this Go client allows you to just talk to the to soft layer using Go. And of course, the CPI project uses that. Um, so this is what happens when you use this thing. So you can see, um, you know, we're spinning up this director, right? We had to pass it the stem cell, we had to pass it the CPI. And then from there, you can do deployments, right? So let me show you an example of that. Uh, so you saw we had basically a, um, you know, a, you know, Bosch init or director up and running. So the next step is now that we have it, we can actually use Bosch, right? So you got this bootstrap, now you can use Bosch to do a deployment. So this is a deployment of Bluemix itself. And I mean, I won't bore you with the details, but it's much more complicated than what you saw before, because it has all kinds of things in it. It has all the different stuff in Cloud Foundry and so on. And um, you know, it has multiple releases as well and things like that. So let's just move faster because it's going to take some time. And um, you can see it. You know, those are all the different releases. So we got all kinds of stuff that we're deploying, and then uh, we start, you know, with Bosch upload release, of course, which goes through the process of uploading all the release, and then Bosch deploy, which will go and try to deploy uh, this thing. So this is the first part of it, and you can see it's taking some time because. There's like lots of different VMs. So instead of like boring you with the details, I'll just show you. So this is a real Bluemix deployment going on. And this is just the first version of it. Um, and, it's, and it's not even a like production or anything like this. This is a test to OA version, right? Uh, and all you see here are like the VMs. And then each one of those VMs has like all those different jobs that you're seeing here. And then, you know, that's part one. Then we have part two um, that includes like the rest. So the point of showing you this is to say that um, without Bosch um, managing such a complex, you know, um, deployment uh, would be almost impossible, right? So that's what, that's what Bosch does. And the CPI is your way to connect Bosch to your cloud, OK? Another important piece was the stem cell. So what is a stem cell? Is that image, right, that initial image. So the Bosch team provides a stem cell builder that you can customize. So for instance, we've customized it for software. Um, uh, I think Microsoft customized it for Azure. Uh, certainly Pivotal has one version for AWS. And then there's also a version for OpenStack, so that if you want to deploy on OpenStack, uh, you can uh, use those initial uh, images. The beauty of this whole idea of stem cell is, as you know, um, on the web, people try to hack all the time, right? It's not shouldn't be a surprise to you. So when you have big deployments like this um, that have you know, external facing stuff, you should be very worried about the version of Unix that you're running or Linux and all the different packages that are included in there and whether or not there is a vulnerability and did you apply it. So the stem cell is minimal to include just what's necessary. And then when there is a vulnerability, the team in at Pivotal working with us and SAP and the rest of the Cloud Foundry community provides update to the stem cell then what you can do is you can take your installation and gradually wall that stem cell to your entire installation. So with Bosch, you can actually do that. You upload your stem cell, and then you deploy with that new stem cell. And Bosch will go through and take each VM, stop it, 
apply that, v, uh, that new stem cell, restore it, restore the job, and keep doing that until your entire installation is rolled over to this new version. Right. If you don't see the value of Bosch in something like this immediately, then you need to spend some time thinking of how difficult it is to deal with any small system that includes like 10, 15, 20 VMs, okay, uh, that's running a platform. That's the value, right? So people all the time ask me, oh, what, you know, could you do this in Docker? I'm not gonna say no, but I haven't seen anything more than just one or two things in Docker, right? That's the value of something like this, is that we can operate at scale. Uh, in what I'm showing you is a demo. It's not even close to what we give internally. It's a test demo to away. And already it had close to 30 VMs. Right. A demo to away. So for stem cell, we, we um, you know, won't bore you with the details, but one thing I'll mention is that we've automated all these things with Concourse, which is a new tool also available in Cloud Foundry to allow you to sort of you know, automate different things. And the point of automating things like the stem cell is, is, uh, is that the Pivotal team, the Bosch team at Pivotal, will get some vulnerability. So Chip, the CTO of Cloud Foundry, will send an email saying, hey, there's this new vulnerability. And then the team will go through figuring out, does it affect the stem cell? Does it affect any of the packages? And then they'll come up with, okay, well, yes, it does, because we need to upgrade the, the, the kernel, or we need to do something like that. Then they'll issue a new stem cell. We will see it immediately in our pipeline, and then we will run it to create a new stem cell, and then that stem cell goes to, to all the different you know, deployment. So, so very, very important. Um, you know, as far as software go, I mentioned it already. It's a it's an independent project that we use to talk to SoftLayer and Go. So if you are a SoftLayer customer or you're interested in looking at SoftLayer, I'd suggest you to go and check it out. Uh, because in that, you know, I guess I could show you quickly. Um, if you go to the first page of this project, so this is it right here. Um, this is what it takes to start a VM in SoftLayer, right? So you specify your username, your API key. You create a new client, of course, with the username and the API key. You set up a template. Uh, the template is essentially telling software, I want a VM in AMS01 data center. I want my memory to be one gig. I want my one CPU or four CPUs or eight CPUs. Of course, you know, depending on what you specify, your cost will vary, right? And then you can specify SSH keys if you want, built in. So, you know, so when it starts, it starts with that. And then you can specify what operating system you want. And then once you have that, you get, you, you, you essentially access the virtual guest service. And then from that virtual guest service, you create the object by passing the template. At this point, it takes a little bit of time and then you get a VM, right? Now, why is it named like virtual guest and why is it named so funny with underscore and stuff like that? Well, it's because if you go to the software uh, documentation and you look at the API, the name is exactly that, except for the get. So what I try to do in this, so I wrote this code, okay, pretty much most of it. Um, and what I did is to exactly make the code look like the API so that when you look to the doc documentation of the API, you can almost imagine how the Go code is, okay? So, um, so let's get back to the CPI. Uh, the next thing to mention is um, the CPI code. So the CPI code um, is inspired from Bosch Warden CPI. So uh, Dimitri, who is uh, the PM for Bosch, uh, if you don't know him, he's a good guy to know. Uh, he's kind of a minor genius in some ways. Um, evil, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not true. Uh, he's a good guy. Uh, but uh, he wrote the first version of, of the Warden CPI, and I looked at what he did and got inspired. And he actually worked with me on uh, the initial version of the Bosch uh, uh, software CPI. Um, so I already showed you some demo and test. Uh, this is 
like captured stuff in case my video didn't work. So this is a, a good example. So what's next? What's coming up next? Um, we're essentially in the process right now of deploying this in production. So uh, there's some tests going on. There's, of course, you know, people find problems and so on. But that's what we're doing. So all of this is pretty much done. Um, in the future, one of the important things to mention is bare metal. So soft layer has the ability for you to, um, when you deploy, um, you know, when you create a VM, you can create virtual guests, which tend to be just like Amazon VMs. But you can also create the same exact code, but just different template, a bare metal. And what that is, is instead of being a virtual machine, it's a real hardware, piece of hardware that gets dedicated to you. Of course, it costs a lot more, but if you need to run, say, Redis into an environment where you have full control of the hardware, uh, that's the way to do it. And we have that support right now in the CPI, but the problem with it is those, vert, those bare metal take significantly more time than uh, virtual guests. And for any deployment of, say, Cloud Foundry, where you'd probably need like five or 10 of those bare metals, it would take you like orders of magnitude longer. So the way we're solving this is by allowing you to specify pools so you could pre-create those bare metals beforehand and then use that pool so that way your deployment is a lot faster. So that's one of the things we're trying to do right now. And then we're looking at other storage support for bare metal. And of course, Bluemix is using this, and Bluemix is a very complex project that includes dedicated and, and the public and the local. So as we go through the process of using it across Bluemix, um, you know, we'll, we might make some changes. So, that's important. So I did this talk in China because my team is in China. So let me show you the guys. So this is uh, Matt and John Q. So those are kind of like the lead engineers on this. Um, and you can see them working here. They were doing this uh, recorded demo for me right now. Uh, this is their manager, uh, Lily. And then we also have Gubin, who's also one of the engineers in this. And then Jimmy, who's uh, one of the guys uh, working on DevOps but he actually does uh, quite a bit of coding as well. And then in, at SVL, we have Swetha, Kara, and John. Those are new hires from us that essentially are part of the uh, community team. And this is Dimitri, uh, our fearless leader in some ways in Bosch, uh, working on this. So let me stop here and see if you guys have any questions. And maybe we can take a short break and then go into the services, OK? So that's what I had. Um, I would recommend you. I, I didn't put this, but uh, let me let me go to it. So Dimitri created a page called Bosch.io, and everything and anything you care to know about Bosch, you should go here. Um, this is pretty much where you'll find a very nice tutorial that Maria created. It will give you like in 15 minutes a complete overview of Bosch. Um, not in the details that I went to, right? But at least in a very nice and fuzzy feeling, why, why Bosch, right? Uh, of course, you got all the you know, links to mailing lists, the tracker project, so you, you can see where it's going, the features that are coming up. This is the current releases um, and the stem cells and so on. So you know, if you're interested in Bosch, uh, this page should be pretty much the place you go to all the time. Okay, so let me stop here and see if you guys have any question. Otherwise, we'll just take 15 minutes to, or well, five minutes to uh, switch over, right? Yes? Uh, how is the uh, Bosch CPI with uh, full software uh, is different from the uh, general purpose like with the OpenStack CPI? Um, so all the other CPIs, except for the Warden CPI, are written in Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, so ours is written in, in Go. Okay. And the word and CPI is written. Do you use any uh, lower uh, level abstraction layers like nope. uh, nothing else? Anything? Nope. We use, I mean, in the code, if you start going to the code, you'll see that it uses the Go libraries. Um, it uses uh, JSON parsing, which comes from Go. Uh, I think Google has some security library that we had to use. 
Uh, that's not part of Golang, so you can plug in your own security library. Uh, and that's it. So there are no certain dependencies? Well, there are. There are uh, right, right. There's no, the, the dependencies are the other projects. So the, the, the CPI project depends on the Go project, the, the software Go project. And those two, I would write the initial version of it with the team. And those depend on Go libraries. Do you anticipate that other CPIs may at some point uh, take uh, the, uh, the Bosch CPI for software as the template? Uh, and it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think I, lo I started with, you know, so Dimitri did the Warden one, and then I used that to build the software. And, you know, I, I thought at first that it could be a nice template. The problem is that there's a lot of changes you need to make. So yes, you could reuse a lot of the code uh, to get started. But the detail, the devil, you know, so you could get a first version very quickly. But the, the, the devil is in the detail. And the detail comes in that software package. So if, you, if we go to that, um, the Bosch Software CPI uh, project on GitHub. Um, oh. Did I lose internet connection? So, uh, so what you're saying is that we have to refer to the software uh, specifics that right. are inherent in, in these Go uh, libraries that software is uh, building. No, 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 no. So what I'm saying is that in, if you look at the CPI code, I don't know, somehow I lost the internet connection. Uh, which one is it? Is it day pass? Yeah. Because I didn't spend it two hours already. Yeah. What is the data page? Yeah, here. So in the good apps, you'll see all the dependencies. Action is setting up the action. So this is reusable. The API is reusable. This is CI, so if you go in there, you'll see the CI code. This is like common stuff. Uh, dev is like you know some files to do some tests. Integration is all integration tests. Main is very small starting. And all of the work is in this guy, software package. And that software package is where you know when the, all of the everything else besides this software understands how when the CP, when the director calls. Um, the CPI and says, create a VM or delete a VM. It passes all the information, right, and so on. So it does all this parsing business, converting, so on. And then in that software package, the actual create VM happens. So if you were to implement this for your own cloud, you could reuse a lot of this except for that package, okay. right? But Go is statically typed, so you'd have to modify pretty much everything else to link to the, to the, to the rest. But you can use it as a template, certainly. Uh, what, what, what was the reason for um, writing a completely new CPI versus uh, taking on and improving on the OpenStack CPI? Oh, do you, no. So we never had the op, um, OpenStack CPI. We didn't start with that. There is an OpenStack CPI that we use as well. But we started with doing our deployment, the public Bluemix deployment, on uh, software. So we wrote a CPI in Ruby. The problem with CPIs and Ruby is that when you write, uh, as I mentioned before, this dependency problem, right? So in Ruby, let's say you use something like Fog to do some of your you know, HTTP requests. And let's say your system, like say for instance Bosch, also uses Fog. But let's say that the Bosch needs version 1.2. I don't know if it's 1.2, but let's say 1.2. Whereas your CPI, for some reason, you found out there's a new API and you needed to upgrade Fog to 1.3. Now, all of a sudden, you got one Ruby virtual machine and two Fog version. Can't do that. So that's where it becomes a problem. Now, by externalizing the CPI, you will run two Ruby virtual machines. But then you also have the issue of, well, what version of Ruby? If you've ever dealt with Ruby, I, I hate to say this about Ruby because I love Ruby as a language. Um, David is, <laughs> is laughing on the back because when I join his team, one of the things I always mention to him is I love Ruby, I really do. But the problem is it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a riot. I mean, there's like version, like there's like three different implementation and then each one has its own version. Right. 
questions? Yeah, I mean, it, it, According to what you are saying, I understand, you know, we should write right uh, OpenStack, make it in Go or whatever, because price, uh, OpenStack in price, price is so much. Yes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, look, I'm not part of the OpenStack team. There is an entire IBM team that does OpenStack. Uh, I, I went to their OpenStack summit in, in Tokyo. I thought it was great. Looks like vibrant community. Um, they got problems, just like everybody else, but I don't think, you know, I wouldn't go there and tell them, go rewrite your code. I'm just telling you my experience, right? In cloud, if I were to do anything right now, do it and go. I will go as far as saying, you're crazy. I never say this lightly. You're crazy if you don't look at Go to do anything in cloud right now. But I'd assume you're doing something new. Because if you have existing code, maybe that's worth using that existing stuff. Sure. Let's say there is a, uh, a project which the objective of the project is to build uh, a Bosch CPI mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, on top of the API that abstracts AWS. Sure. It's essentially, it takes the AWS underlying components, right. compute storage network, right. and exposes them in the API that is similar, but not exactly compatible. Sure. Uh, with the uh, current plan being taking fog, sure. and writing the CPI, uh, just taking the AWS CPI and modifying it, mm -hmm. uh, what are the pros and cons of taking, let's say, this uh, CPI as a template and uh, running with it and adding maybe another right. provider in there, whether it's public or private? Mm -hmm. Instead of software, there would be one more line in here. One well, I mean, there's a reason the Bosch team is not going through the process of rewriting their existing CPIs in Go. If they're doing new stuff, they would do it. I think the, 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 the reason is simply, um, you know, as you saw, building any of these stuff requires a fair amount of engineering, uh, whatever language. And the devil's in the detail. It's not just the writing of the code, it's the testing, it's the getting it correct, right? Maintaining and so on. And, you know, we're fortunate at IBM to have the resources where even though I started this, I engaged with a team in China and I got a dedicated team. And I, like last year, I went there three times and I'm going again <laughs> next month. Um, so in some sense, I'm you know, lucky to have IBM's sort of resources to, to deal with it. If, you don't, if you're not in that situation, then it might be a problem, right? It might, it might make more sense to just reuse what exists there and I know the AWS API is written in Ruby, so you could probably use it. So I'm not here to advocate languages. I'm just telling you for cloud stuff, um, you know, what you need to deploy and so on. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, it makes sense to look at Go. If you're not starting from scratch, then you know, you're, you gotta use other things. Um, Thank you. Sure. So I, I have some questions, but very short. Sure. Yeah. Most of the questions have been answered by, uh, by you. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you, does it support multi-cloud besides software like a major cloud, like a GC, Google Computing Engine, as well as AWS, why not? Yeah, there is, there is a CPI for Google Compute Engine. Okay. Yes, I think Pivotal created it as a prototype. I don't know if Google no. is involved. No. Uh, I, I don't know. Actually, you can Google it. <laughs> no, no, we didn't do that. But I think I think there is there is one. Somebody did one for for Google Computer Engine. There is one for Azure, by the way, too. No. The the perform performance is not really so much of an issue here because. Um, if you think of, you know, well, yeah, I mean, there's other reasons too, right? It's statically typed and so on, but um, the performance is not an issue because if you think of these cloud APIs, even AWS, which is very fast, right? Like you spin up a VM in AWS takes about a minute. But if you think about how quick even a program in Ruby or Python or whatever language you have, you can execute the code to spin up the VM to issue the command, okay, 
uh, in, let's say, 10 milliseconds max, right? Maybe even less than that. But the time to actually start the VM is close to a minute. So you're like three orders of magnitude. So it's not that the bottleneck is not in the code, the CPI code. Yeah, but it's in the, the, the cloud itself. I do agree with you that because the majority of line now is a VM based cloud uh, provision. But uh, think about a container. If you are launching right. container, that's much faster. Yes, 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 yes. So Dimitri, yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting you mentioned container. Dimitri wrote a CPI for yeah. Docker. Yeah, yeah, and he would it and go, and you can you can check it out. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, are there any last questions before we move on to the next session? Okay. Good. All well, right. I'd like to thank so, you, by the way, for sure. This session. Yeah, you're welcome. And, uh, <laughs> we'll do the next one faster. It's a little bit more fun. The yeah, next one. Uh, before we move on to the next one, I just wanted to um, kind of wrap up by simply uh, uh, making sure that folks have the resources that you are sharing here. Yeah, yeah. So I, I give the slides and we'll share them. Yes. Slides, by the way, your, where's the best place to go to find more information about you and your... Oh, me? Uh, just go to Twitter. I mean, I think, you know, my Twitter, Maximilian, yeah. It's probably the best way because I, I kind of keep, you know, talk about stuff that's going on. Okay. you got Maximilian.org. Yeah, yeah. If you go there, um, I guess, yes, you're right. Yeah, so this one will point you to all the different connections.